All right, well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Accessibility New York City, the December 2018 edition. Uh, very happy to have you all here at ThoughtBot. Um, we host our meetup here monthly, and we really appreciate ThoughtBot being our event host. Uh, my name is Thomas Logan. I'm one of the co-organizers of the event. Uh, we have two co-organizers not here tonight, uh, Sean Laureate and Cameron Cundiff. And we want to celebrate. We have a fourth co-organizer now, Tyson Gatch. Uh, if you've been to our events, he's been here pretty consistently um, over the years. So we're happy to have him now part of the team helping organize the event. So any of us, if you haven't met us, uh, you know, come up and meet us. If you're interested in presenting at the event or you have a topic you'd like the New York City community and the YouTube streaming world to know about, uh, please let us know. At the event, we have our uh, live captions, communication access real time is provided by White Coat Captioning. And thank you to Diane, our captioner tonight. She's providing these captions remotely. Um, and we do this as part of every event that we do here for the meetup. Uh, I want to thank Jolly McPhee from the Internet Society of New York, who produces our live stream. Special interest group. Oh, the Accessibility Special Interest Group of the Internet Society of New York. Yeah, that's the best interest group in our opinion. <laughs> so uh, thank you to Jolly for always putting together like an amazing stream here. We've got some cameras and speakers in the back. So, you know, we strive every event to make sure that people that can't attend in person can fully participate in the online stream. And any presentations you might have missed of our uh, meetup, which has been going for over three years now, um, you can find those on YouTube with the captions and you know with the accessible alternatives. So we're very excited tonight to have Matthew Kleiman from Pivotal Labs DC uh, to speak with us. Pivotal Labs was actually the first um, event host for Accessibility New York City here in New York. So I already have a great um, connection with that company and super excited for Matthew's talk tonight. I think it's one of our most exciting titles, maybe our most exciting title, uh, Why Pair Programming is Better Than Adderall. And I'm excited to learn from you, Matthew, so take it away. Thank you, Thomas. All right, thanks everyone for joining and for everyone on the live stream. I really appreciate the, uh, the audience and your attention. Um, as you said, my name's Matthew Kleiman. Uh, I'm a software engineer and manager in the DC office of uh, Pivotal Labs. Uh, but I started my Pivotal career here in the New York office. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about my journey to uh, my journey as a software engineer um, and my, my journey to finding Pivotal Labs and the practices of pair programming and test-driven development and how they've helped me. Uh, the message that I'm trying to convey here um, is that I hope um, to like share that we should all seek out work environments that nourish our strengths as, as humans and as, um, as workers. So um, I have uh, ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. I also um, was uh, diagnosed with some other learning disabilities when I was younger. Um, and a lot of it, uh, especially ADD, centers around, um, or it's in the category of like an executive functioning disorder. Um, although I don't really like to use the word disorder. But um, specifically executive functioning, what that means is, uh, uh, it's like the ability to uh, analyze and plan out tasks and make decisions about those tasks, do them in a certain order, carry them out. Um, for myself, as someone with ADD, uh, I'm capable, fully capable, of doing all of the things that I just mentioned. However, uh, I have a really hard time doing them in the order that most of us might expect the these tasks to be done in. Um, you know, people with ADD are traditionally uh, defined by their distractedness, uh, difficulty focusing, um, and I, I think that 
these things are very much true about myself, but uh, I also like to define it as a gift. Um, you know, the things that uh, me as someone with ADD, uh, the, the gifts that I have from this are my creativity, uh, my interpersonal intuition, my ability to kind of like see other people in maybe in ways that uh, most people don't, don't see. Um, my exuberance, as evidenced by me coming here and talking with you all today, um, and my natural curiosity. Um, and uh, as you'll see through the, the journey of my, my life till today, um, it's, it's only more recently that I've kind of discovered uh, how, how, these, how these traits are gifts um, uh, in my career. So uh, the journey starts, let's say, around fifth grade. Um, I, uh, my parents were both uh, public school teachers, and I was a very high-functioning student. Uh, I, I did uh, very well in school, and I got good grades and all of that, but my parents uh, were, I think, partly because of their training as teachers, were able to see that even though I was doing well on paper, I was really struggling. I was putting a lot of energy, a lot of effort into uh, everything, everything that I was doing. Um, and uh, through their understanding of other students that they had with ADD, they decided to have, uh, have me go through some testing, some psychological testing. Um, and that's you know, basically uh, the first step in, in um, you know, in, in, uh, in diagnosing someone with uh, ADD or, or some other uh, learning disability to, to understand, um, you know, uh, at a clinical level uh, how someone might be differently abled. Um, and uh, once that happened, I was given that diagnosis. I was given um, accommodations all through uh, middle school and high school. My teachers were giving, oops, sorry, my, my teachers were giving me um, extra time on, on tests so that I could uh, spend a little bit extra time using coping skills that I was taught of like how to organize my, my thoughts uh, onto paper. Um, teachers would give me notes um, so because it was very hard for me to take notes as people were, were speaking. Um, another thing that we discovered through that testing was I had a difficulty with auditory processing, the ability to uh, understand what is being said to me um, if there's no visual cue as well. Um, and just like, just to kind of wrap all of that up, I also, before going to college, had uh, another series of tests to reaffirm that diagnosis. Um, it was pretty obvious to me, my parents, my teachers, but in order to continue getting the same accommodations um, as afforded by, uh, you know, the, the government's like accessibility um, laws in college, I, I had to get that diagnosis reaffirmed. And, and it did, and these same accommodations were afforded me in college. Uh, you know, one thing that was kind of interesting about that, I, uh, I was given note takers in, in, um, in all of my college courses. And what this meant was that my, my friends who were taking the classes with me could basically take their, take their notes and then submit them to the um, accessibility office and, uh, you know, to, like make a printout for me and then they would get like, you know, I don't know, like $20 or something for each class. So they appreciate that and certainly I appreciated it too. Um, so what did this mean? It meant that I was able to be as successful as I could be as a student um, all the way through the end of college. Um, and that really made me feel good. You know, I, I was a successful student. I was, you know, achieving to the level that, that I could. Um, and uh, all of that, all of that changed one day when I graduated from college and entered the real world. 
Um, I, I no longer had the same accommodations that were afforded to me, um, you know, by law in, in school. Um, but I wasn't thinking about things this way. And in fact, I kind of landed in a lucky situation because uh, the first job that I had out of college was at a Logan Hardware Store, which was a local hardware store in Washington, D.C. And um, there I found a really good situation for myself. I was uh, on the floor helping customers every single day um, because it was shift work in a retail environment, every task that I had to do was very small and manageable. It, you know, whatever I was doing for a day, it had to be finished by the end of my shift. Uh, no one else was going to do it. Um, and so I had small manageable tasks. It was interactive work. It was hands-on. It was fun, fr quite frankly. Uh, I was using communication skills and problem solving skills every day. People would come with, you know, like, here's a, a screw that I have, like, and I would help find the nut for it, you know, and, and like little things like that, um, that would take five minutes and give me like little wins every day. I loved that job and I really flourished there. I got all the way, uh, you know, in just a couple of years, I got all the way to, uh, you know, like the assistant manager of uh, one of the departments in this, in this store. However, uh, I went to school, I went to college for computer engineering, and uh, the bulk of like my interest in college was in uh, like in software development, in, in application development. And I think I always kind of wanted to get back into that, and quite frankly, I wanted to make more money than I was making in uh, the retail field. So I decided I'm going to go back to... Um, I'm going to go back into, or I'm going to go into the tech industry, and um, that's where things started to go downhill in the context of uh, what we're talking about here today and, and my ADD uh, and how it impacted my career. I went through a series of jobs. Um, sorry, I went through a series of jobs. Uh, like the first one was uh, here in New York at a financial services company, and it was a globally distributed team. My manager was in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, the bulk of my team was in um, India and the Philippines, and I was like the sole developer here in, uh, in the U.S., in, in New York. And I found myself quite isolated in that experience. I very much enjoyed the people that I worked with. We would, you know, talk over over you know Skype that kind of thing, and um, have a lot of good good times together. Um, however, that was only like a portion of my day because of the the time zone overlaps, and most of the time I was alone and unable to really use that uh, interpersonal intuition that I talked about where I could like sit next to someone and like see them face to face and understand how they're feeling and um, have those like really close communication. Um, also, it really stifled my exuberance. I was kind of alone in, in this environment. Most of the communication I was having was uh, over messaging. And uh, just for the way that I work, the way that I think, that kind of communication just doesn't doesn't excite me in the way uh, that this kind of communication does. So um, fast forward a little bit to another job where I was um, actually starting a company. I, I decided to start a, a, do a startup, a tech startup with uh, another person. And I was acting as like the, the technical co-founder. Um, my partner was the, like, the CEO. But um, I... Uh, I found that that situation was extremely difficult for myself. You know, go back to like the, the definition that I used for ADD as an executive functioning disorder. Like by definition, the CEO, um, uh, although I was not the CEO of the company with two people, like we were, I was doing a lot of that work. And I've just told you that that kind of thinking is extremely difficult for me. It's not my strength. And that showed very quickly when uh, I and one other person were trying to start and, and, and field a company together. 
Um, a similar thing happened when um, I was working at the Park Slope Food Co-op. I'm actually really excited to give this talk uh, here in New York again because uh, many of you may know about the Park Slope Food Co-op. But uh, for those of you who don't, it's, it's essentially a grocery store. But it is a cooperative, and it's owned and operated by its members. In order to work there, you have to be a member. And in order to be, a, uh, sorry, in order to shop there, you have to be a member. And in order to be a member, you have to work there for two hours and 45 minutes every four weeks. Um, it's a fascinating environment. It's a very like socialist kind of structure, as you can imagine. It comes from like the ideas that came out of the 60s. Um, and it's the largest one of its kind in the world, 16,000 members. And as the sole web developer at the Park Slope Food Co-op, I had 16,000 stakeholders, 16,000 users. Um, and as I mentioned, it was a very socialist kind of structure. So I also had 10 bosses. That entire situation, very similar to my work uh, in the startup, uh, really made it that I had to really be on top of all of the things, be very organized. Um, you know, be the product manager, the designer, the um, the engineer, and I. And also, I had members who were using their uh, were working for the website um, for their you know three hours a month, and um, so I'm like also a project manager, and all of that uh, really was kind of like a recipe for me uh, not to be successful. So uh, after. All of these experiences, plus a couple of other jobs that I haven't even gotten into, uh, this is kind of the despair that I felt. And I came, I came to a point after the food co-op where I was really trying to figure out, like, what is going on? Like, why can't I be happy in this field that I think I'm good at? I enjoyed programming. I enjoy a lot of aspects of engineering but I, I don't feel like I have ever been able to be successful. And so I actually did, at this time, a retrospective. Um, I didn't know the term until, uh, until, until I worked at Pivotal Labs, but I did a retro on my life, on my career. I, saw, I, I, I looked back at all of the jobs that I had and where I, uh, where I really enjoyed, things that really worked well for me, a lot of a lot of action items kind of came out of my work at the uh, at the hardware store, um, and also like what are the things that weren't working for me? That that isolation, um, that uh, distributed team situation, being like a sole person in charge of many many things. And the top action item that came from this retrospective was, I want to try something drastically different. Just run an experiment. I want to do pair programming. Now, I had never done pair programming before in my life. But I had this idea from reading a couple of articles that like maybe that would be uh, something that could solve my problems. And like, let me just explain pair programming uh, for those of you who aren't aware. What this means is that you have two programmers who are working to solve one problem. You got two programmers sitting side by side. Uh, for ergonomic reasons, we like to have two, com two monitors, two keyboards, two mice, but they're attached to one computer. The displays are mirrored. If I am programming, uh, if I am typing, then my pair, she better not be typing because we will be literally be typing on top of each other. Um, and when, uh, when I sought out uh, an environment where I could try out pair programming, I found Pivotal Labs, where we do pair programming uh, you know, eight hours a day, every day. And in fact, that's what we teach our clients. That's the uh, core of, of, of our values as, uh, as, as engineers. Um, and so I went to the interview, which consisted of pair programming for an entire day on uh, real projects at Pivotal. And I absolutely loved it. I was blown away by how 
great of an experience I had in that one day of pair programming. Um, and since then, I've been pair programming every day for three years. Um, and I've come to realize why, uh, or I, I've come to realize why that first experience of pair programming, and in fact, every day at Pivotal, has been so powerfully um, uh, enabling for me. Um, let's start with the idea of communication. I mentioned that uh, interpersonal intuition and communication were th are things that are uh, strengths of mine. And by being, by being able to uh, sit side by side with someone, work together constantly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to communicate all throughout my day, something that uh, I wasn't able to do when I was working alone, and I really enjoy that. Another thing, that distractedness that, we talked, that I talked about with, uh, uh, with ADD, is the idea that I am now accountable to someone else. The chances that I, sitting alone, will become distracted whether it's something external, like uh, some, someone coming over and, and, and bothering me, or uh, deciding to go look at, uh, at Facebook or Instagram, uh, or, or even just like my own mind of like, I'm trying to solve a problem one way, and I veer off into like some rabbit hole. The chances that all of those things could happen while I'm working with someone else, and they also go in the same direction, are very, very slim, and that's what I've discovered. Uh, that it's unlikely that me and my pair will get distracted in the same way together. And there's one, one final thing I want to talk about with pair programming is the idea of metacognition, which is the uh, act of thinking about thinking. So uh, in uh, modern uh, research around attention deficit disorder, there's this idea that... Um, a, a, a tactic we can use to help use to, to help use more of the brain, uh, especially like the frontal lobe, which is where a lot of that executive functioning is happening, is to use metacognition to try to uh, think about the decisions that we're making at like a meta level. And with pair programming, it is, it is uh, necessary. To, for me to constantly be in communication with my pair about what it is that I am thinking, why I'm thinking that. If I have some idea and I just start typing it, my pair is gonna be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? It's just not fair to them for me to go off on my own. That's not pair programming, that's me writing code while someone else is watching. So the um, the structure that's in place for for pair programming forces me to express my ideas out loud. And the amazing thing is that if you think about it, just trying to like take an idea which lives like I don't know somewhere in one part of your brain, and then put it into the part of your brain that uh, turns thought into speech. That's a different part of your brain. And so I'm constantly like using a lot more of my brain in order to express my ideas out loud, which, um, which allows my pair to understand me. And by extension is allowing me to be more metacognitive. And um, I find that my brain is much more active when I'm pairing and I'm also a lot more tired at the end of the day. <clears throat> okay, so um, we have another core practice in engineering at Pivotal Labs, which is test-driven development. Now, I didn't know, I, I knew that Pivotal did test-driven development. It is not why I went there. I went there to try pair programming, this one experiment, and I discovered many other things, including test-driven development. So uh, first, let me tell you what this is for those of you who um, aren't familiar with it. Test-driven development is the idea that we should never write any code without having first written a test that tells us, that asserts what the behavior of our application should be. 
To say it another way, I'm always constantly uh, writing tests that assert how I want my uh, application to behave, what the users should expect out of my application. And then of course, that test will fail because I have not written the code yet. So that test will be failing and failing until I write enough code to make that test pass. And there's a whole, there's a whole um, discipline around how to do this, but at, at its high, highest level, I'm writing the tests before I'm writing the code. And I bring this, I bring this up because, um, over, let, let me take one step back before talking about test-driven development and share with you what I used to do to try to keep myself on task before I was working at Pivotal Labs. When I was working alone in a cubicle uh, on a computer with the entire internet at my disposal, I had to do, uh, put in place a lot of scaffolds in order to keep myself from being distracted. So uh, it's very easy for me to be distracted. So some things that I would have done were um, put timers, regular timers, like maybe every 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and the timer would go off, and I would be like, oh, uh, am I doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing right now? And even that kind of had a problem, because like sometimes I would be doing the thing I was supposed to be doing, and the timer would distract me. And you know, it, it's just like a, a, a series of uh, painful, painful moments. But these were the scaffolds that I had to do in fact, things that I learned from years and years of, of uh, how to be a student, for example. Now with TEF-driven development, it's, it's actually uh, just the opposite. I don't have to put in place any scaffolds. In fact, I, I let in um, distractions today without any worry. And here's why. At any moment, I can run the tests and see which tests are failing, and that reminds me where I should be working. And in the, in the world of, of like me being distracted, whether it's my own brain, or whether it's a product manager wants to come over and talk about some story that they've written, it's, it's perfectly fine by me. I'll step away from the computer and come back to it. Uh, maybe even the next day I can come back and know exactly where I've left off. And so um, I find that this scaffold that's built into the way we work is uh, allowing me to be a more efficient programmer, a more efficient employee, and in fact, it's just making me happier, making me so I'm not worried all the time about what am I missing, what am I forgetting. Um, what does this mean? Three years I've been doing this. And over that time, I've felt better and better about myself. Compare the, the way that I'm talking about uh, working in this way. Compare that to how I discussed um, my earlier career and some of the challenges that I had there. My self-worth as an engineer, as an employee, as a person has increased over this time. And um, it's allowed me to grow in ways that I really never had even imagined. Um, for example, uh, this past year, I became a manager at Pivotal Labs. And I never would have thought that I could not only be successful in my career, but be able to like share the, um, you know, like my passion for my work with others and help them grow their careers. Um, I would not have been able to do this three years ago without these practices that I'm talking about. It's just uh, quite amazing that, uh, my, that I was able to find a place where my way of thinking matched the way that, the, uh, that we work at Pivotal Labs. And um, <clears throat> I think about the core function of my work, it was always a struggle. My, I, I was an engineer, I was a software developer, and the core function of my work was writing code. 
And I struggled in that every single day. And it made my life as an engineer unmanageable. But now, these inadvertent accommodations, such as pair programming and test-driven development, they've helped, me, they've helped make me just like everyone else. It's kind of like leveled the playing field where I only struggle with some of the things, um, but not all of the things like I used to. It's pretty wild to think that um, Pivotal didn't create these practices for me. 30 years ago, um, when Rob Me created Pivotal Labs, he used pair programming and test-driven development because he believed, and, and I believe now, um, as, as we all do at Pivotal Labs, that this is the best way to build software. I'm, uh, I'm just like really, I'm really happy that it's also the best way for me to be building software. And that's the, um, the great takeaway that I have from my, uh, from my experience here. So to go back to like the lesson that I learned, that, I, that I'm trying to like share from this, uh, from this experience that I've had, it's that um, I, I really encourage everyone to seek out a work environment that nourishes your strengths and makes you feel valued as an individual, as a human, as a worker. Um, these ideas have truly made my life a lot better. And um, I've seen the same thing with, in other people. And that's a message that I want to like share with, with others. And this, this might mean seeking out a new, a new job, uh, a new company that has a different kind of work environment like I did. It might mean seeking out a completely different career. Or it might mean working with your company, with your uh, leadership, to enact changes within your organization in order to uh, make the way you work uh, make the way your company works better for the way that you best work. Um, I'd like to I'd like to end with uh, one more story. There's something uh, there's something here that's quite important. Um, the idea of empathy, empathy for other people. Um, it's critically important when pair programming. I mean, you have to work eight hours a day with another person. You need to be empathetic of, of their needs and their desires, their thoughts, absolutely. Um, and, it's, and, and to the message of what I was trying to share, there's uh, uh, another part of empathy that I think is really important. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a, a quick story. Um, my wife and I went to a, a workshop um, actually, at the Park Slope Food Co-op, uh, a, a member of the food co-op, she hosted a workshop um, um, for couples where one of the couple was uh, had ADD. Um, and, and spoiler, like I, I'm the person who has ADD in our relationship. And in the workshop, we, we did an exercise where we listed... Uh, all the things, or a bunch of things that we appreciated about our partner on one side. And on the other side, we listed a number of traits that we found particularly annoying about our partner. And then we were asked to draw lines between um, like one trait on the left and a trait on the right. And try to make a connection between things that annoyed us and things that, um, that we appreciated. So for example, my wife said that she appreciated that I'm, I'm good at figuring out how things work, which is very, very kind of her. Um, but she also finds it very annoying and, and in a related way uh, that I like to touch everything. So how this plays out, when we go and rent a car, uh, like we'll rent a car at the airport, pick it up in the, in the lot, and um, she gets in, 
uh, you know, I guess like usually, usually I'm, I'm probably driving, right? So she gets in the passenger seat and, uh, she, you know, she puts her, her, her coat away, uh, buckles up and, and she's ready. She's ready to go. I get in and like, it's like 10 minutes of fiddling with the, uh, windshield wipers and the lights and, and buttons. And like, I got to pair my phone to the Bluetooth and, you know, like take out maybe the owner's manual of the car. Um, and it's like a whole ordeal. And as time goes on, you know, minutes are passing and she's getting more and more frustrated. And this is a pattern that we have. But what will often, uh, what, what can happen here is that uh, half an hour later, we'll be driving down on the highway and she finds herself maybe uncomfortable in her seat. And she's like trying to figure out like, how do I, how do I make myself comfortable? And I'm like, oh, well, you just got to press the one button over there to like adjust your seat. And she's like, oh, well, like, how'd you know that? Um, and it's this, it's this story that uh, kind of like makes me, makes me realize, and, and this is where the empathy comes into play, that uh, it's important, you know, whether in, in a, a couple like me and my wife or on a, a team uh, at work that we rely heavily on each other's strengths and focus on that and be empathetic about how each other works. All of us approach problems differently, which at times can be really frustrating. Um, but what frustrates us in one moment might be become an asset in a different situation. Um, you know, every person that you meet, every person on your team, we all have unique ways of thinking and unique ways of learning. And next time you're finding yourself getting a little bit frustrated with uh, your team members, just uh, remember that thought that, you know what, Everyone's think, everyone has a different way of thinking, but uh, we're all valuable members of, of the team. Uh, okay, thank you. That, that's what I uh, had to share for you today. Um, and I think we're gonna answer some questions now. So you just recently, oh, great job, here. I really learned a lot. This is really interesting. Um, I don't have ADD, but um, I find this interesting if I do work with people with ADD, so this is great to know and something I can think about. Um, so you just recently uh, went into a management position, correct? So how has that trans transition been from uh, pair programming, if you still do it, to management, and how, what's that been like at this company? Oh, uh, yeah. Um uh, thank you. I really appreciate that question. I, I, I realize now that um, so that's, that's really good feedback. So let me be clear on, on what my, my new role is. Um, like, you know, 85%, 90% of my job is exactly the same as it was, is pair programming, test-driven development every day, uh, consulting with clients, like teaching our clients how to do these practices. Um, and... Uh, that other 10, 15 percent, maybe maybe more, it probably adds up to more than 100 percent now, um, is is the management part. And the way uh, you know, like the way management works at Pivotal is so I'm I'm mostly an individual contributor, and I have several reports, and I work with them to help them grow their careers, um, give them advice, help help them get feedback from other people, feedback from their clients, and so on. Um, so that, that's the structure of my, my new job, my new role, which is just a, a little slightly different. Uh, it's basically the same as my old role, but uh, with, with some added uh, responsibilities as a manager. Um, but uh, I would like to, I would like to like be honest with everyone that the reality is that being a manager this past year has been very much a challenge for me. A lot of the aspects of management are, 
are like heading into the direction of some of the things that I talked about. The idea that I uh, am kind of isolated, like I am alone, the manager for my six reports. Um, and there's, you know, there's certainly I can work with other managers. I can pair with other managers on my team to, uh, you know, get ideas and, you know, uh, maybe get feedback on, on things that I'm doing. But like the bulk of the work like comes, comes down to me. Um, it's not like I am a team of managers working with my reports. And that's definitely something I'm, I'm missing and, and it's been a challenge. I think it's a challenge that I'm excited about because there's so much about management that is just um, like warms my heart. You know, the idea of servant leadership and like giving of myself to another person to like help them uh, grow and, and seek out, you know, seek out an environment that nourishes their strengths help them create an environment that nourishes their strengths, um, do the things that I can do within my power to make sure that our DC office is an environment that nourishes the strengths of the people in the office. Um, these are really fulfilling statements that I'm making, but the reality is it's, it's hard. You know, I'm back into the same, the same ideas of like uh, working alone towards goals and uh, there's a lot of uh, task-oriented, executive functioning kind of things that I have to do. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing story. You know, like maybe maybe next year we'll we'll be talking, uh, telling a different story. I don't know. This is all really cool to hear about. Um, I'm. It's. It sounds really interesting that sort of just a best practice in like life practice ended up being best practice for everyone. So the more inclusive you are in the way that you design your practice, the more people benefit from it, which sounds like really what happened. I'm really curious, you talked about there being scaffolds built in that you didn't have to make for yourself. They're just built into the process of how you are doing your work. I'm curious if you've seen other types of work that have those kind of built in scaffolds in other places or with other clients that you've worked that kind of mimic that because I think that's a really interesting thing it just seems like it's built into the workflow so it's not a separate kind of accommodation it's just there I'm curious if you have other examples of that in places yeah um <clears throat> so I'm trying to think of uh and I'm, tr I'm I'm really trying hard to think of an example outside of the like my experience at Pivotal and uh I'm coming up short right now. I, I'm sure that there are. Like, this is not the only way to work as much. It's the only. It, it seems like the only way to work for me. But, um, but that that's not the lesson that I'm trying to share. That like everyone should be pair programming. Um, I think there's other. I can I can share like within within the lens of like a balanced team at Pivotal, uh, product managers and uh, designers and engineers. Um, so. Uh, I mentioned that uh, executive functioning, like the idea of like having having tasks and and um, uh, doing them in a, in a certain order and like making decisions around that, uh, that can be a challenge for me. So the way that we the way that we do agile is with uh, extremely small stories, um, very thin slices of work, and so each story could be. You know, like ideally is something that, you know, although we don't uh, estimate by time, like it, it's ideally something that takes less than a day to uh, implement if, if we can manage that. And so I rely on the product managers to write those stories in a very, very small way with a lot of detail, a lot of detail around, you know, like these are the two scenarios that um, when you're done with your story, the, the application will now have, you know, like these two scenarios covered. And um, I, I, in fact, have, have tried to be a product manager at Pivotal Labs. There was a project that I was on for about a month that we didn't have a product manager. Um, and, and so I stepped into that role. And I found it extremely challenging. And the, the most challenging part of it was to 
for me to like create that scaffold, to create those stories with, with like the task of like, it's gotta do this and this and this for the other engineers. And um, I realize now, like kind of in the context of what you're talking about, I am relying heavily on the organizational skills of our product managers in order to give me work that I can do um, within like within my abilities to do it. Because the alternative to that, which is, which is what I've done in the past, is someone saying like, you know, here's a requirement, like you, you gotta build an app that, that has a login. And that is like way too much for, for my brain to break down alone. You know, I need to work with other people to, you know, create that scaffold for me of like, here are 10 stories that represent the, the epic of a login page. Um, and I'm just gonna do the first story. And I don't have to worry about those other stories because I'm, I'm just doing this first story and it's like there's, you know, there, there's a button on the page. And I can do that. I can make a button on the page. Um, but what I can't do is make a login page because that requires uh, organizing into 10 different steps, doing those steps in order, um, and, and, and like that's just not where my strengths lie. Any other questions in the room? Oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I have a two-part question. Um, one is relating to um, the practice of pair programming and productivity. I wonder if you have any, um, if or if you you for you either you or Pivotal Labs has any um, sort of case studies or anything empirical sort of supporting um, pair programming and some of these practices that show that productivity either increases or bug counts decrease. Um, most of the studies I've seen on it suggest that pair programming really gets you to the velocity of the higher performer of the pair as opposed to raising the net performance of two people. And along those same lines, the second part of that question is, how do you find pairs that are really complementary and that allow people to get along together very well? Like, I haven't had super extensive experience with pair programming, at least not in a corporate setting, but it seems like from the pairs I've seen, it either is like very hit or miss. So how do you kind of optimize for that? And, or do you let it grow organically? Or yeah, what would you say about that? Okay, sure. Um, I'll ask you to just hold on to the mic for a sec, because uh, okay, sure. let, let me start with the first part of that question. Um, oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, the first part of that question is about uh, pair programming and productivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there are definitely have have been studies about pair programming um, and productivity. Uh, I'm not very good at like remembering the details of something like a study or anything like that, but um, you know maybe maybe afterwards we can like we could look something up together. Uh, but more broadly, like here's here's how I I look at it, um, and, and not me alone. Like this is this is certainly like Pivotal Labs' view of things, right? Um, that when you have uh, two people working on problem together. You, um, for one, you, you're, you're not gonna have to do any code review. So you, you've already eliminated this, like the extra time that it takes to do code review, because you've got two eyes on the problem at all times. It's instantaneous code review. That's one of the big reasons why we do this. Um, additionally, you, uh, you're like constantly like, thinking, uh, doing that metacognition, thinking about your thinking, working with another person, um, it's necessarily gonna increase the quality of the code that the two people are producing. Even, even an extremely high-performing programmer working with a very, very junior person um, in like the worst kind of situation where like the high-performing programmer is just doing a lot of typing and the junior programmer is just watching, which, by the way, that is not how we should do pair programming. But even in that situation, the junior, the junior programmer is, is gonna notice things that the high performer, uh, like, like the, the very senior programmer, uh, you know, may make like, you know, small mistakes in the moment. Or uh, the junior person will ask questions. Now we're getting into like, 
uh, how pair programming really should work. The junior person is going to ask a lot of questions about like, well, why do we do this? You know, like, how does it work? Tell me the context, right? And now you've got the senior person like answering questions about this, sharing that context, and it's it's creating like extra metacognition for that senior person, right? There's also the idea of um, like you know, like what's unfortunately called the bus count, or like I like to call it the lottery count, right? So like you've got a senior p programmer who's been on this team for 10 years and is the only person who knows this part of the system. If that person wins the lottery and leaves the company, the whole team just stops in velocity. With pair programming, the way, the way we work, if, uh, right now I'm actually on an extremely large team with five pairs. So we have 10 engineers, that's huge. But more typically, let's say we have three pair, two, three pairs of engineers. So in three pairs, we've got six engineers, and every day we're pairing, we're rotating our pairs. So I'm pairing with a different person every day. And with a three pair project, I can easily every week visit every, uh, every bit of, of code that's being worked on. And so every one of those six people has full context on that application. If someone's sick, no problem. If two people are sick, no problem. If four people are sick or four people are on vacation, no problem. The team slows down, certainly, but you still got one pair that can do anything, uh, can pick up any story on the backlog and, and work on it. So this is my way of saying that it's more than just how fast can a developer or a pair of developers go? Uh, there's many other factors that I, you know, that go just that go beyond just the team that you got to think about, like a, at a business level. Um, and uh, oh, I, I. <laughs> I could talk about this, uh, you know, this is my job. I could talk about this for, for all night, but let me, let me get to your, your other question, if you could remind me. Oh yeah, the other question was just um, trying to maximize the complementarity of the workers so that they can work well together. And like, I guess when you look at high performing pairs, as opposed to just like individuals, like what characteristics or qualities show up most frequently? Yeah. Um, I think, I will say this, you know, pair programming is not for everyone. Um, it does, it takes a lot of empathy to, uh, to pair all day with another human being, to, uh, to work with someone so closely and, uh, you know, care about what they're, what they're thinking, um, you know, care when, you know, so like, let's say, let's say I am uh, a very senior engineer, I've been on this project for a while, I can move pretty fast because I know this system, whatever. If I have a brand new junior person who just joined the team, right, I have to have a lot of empathy for that person's situation. I have to understand like they're new, they're eager, they wanna learn, so I'm gonna have to go slower in order to help them learn and grow to the point where they finally can move a lot faster. Um, and that's the kind of thing, like th that's the kind of trait that's needed, that empathy, that, that patience, that caring, um, you know, and to different degrees, right? Like some people are extremely empathetic and make amazing pairs. Um, some people have differing levels of empathy and still make good pairs, maybe not as amazing as that first person I talked about. Um, so uh, there's, yeah, there's, there's, I can't stress enough how, how important empathy is. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's the most important trait that's, that's needed. Um, additionally, I think like this idea of rotating around really helps a lot. Um, there are times when you have just two people on a project um, and they're just, you know, we call that like pair married to each other the entire length of a project. Um, you know, in that situation, if they are not, if they're not compatible with each other, um, and willing to give each other feedback in order to, or willing to give each other feedback to make them more compatible for each other, then it's going to be, uh, 
maybe a little bit painful process. Um, whereas if you have these three pairs, six people, and you're like, only once every five days am I working with uh, the one person who maybe uh, doesn't, I'm not as compatible with, like that, that's a little bit less of a severe situation. Um, and that, that thing about feedback, that's the other like most important thing, is that uh, people who are pairing have to be willing to give each other feedback, accept feedback, have very short feedback loops so that they can grow and be better pairs uh, and, and help other people be better pairs to, to them uh, or else the system is not going to work for them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's pretty good. Thanks. Anyone else? Hi. Um, so I heard you talk about like working at Logan and your love for this kind of true human connection and being with other people. And, you know, I see that, you know, you also had trouble with executive functioning and then now you're manager. And so I just imagine being a manager involves a lot of it. Um, could you talk a little bit about like, was this like a process that was more like I evolved into this role or was it something that you just came to find within you like that I already had? Um, hmm, interesting. But it's, the answer is probably more to the second thing you've said, like okay. that it's something within me that I always had, but, but like there was never a space for it. Um, so, you know, let's look, look at that, uh, the example of um, when I was working for that distributed team with the, uh, my team in India and the Philippines and my manager in, uh, in Ireland, right? Uh, in that situation, I was like just struggling to get by, you know, like just struggling to be, you know, I, I, I want to say like just be an effective developer on that team. Uh, even that was a stretch, honestly. Um, so there was just no space for me to also consider like, oh, well, like I really care deeply about my team members in India, for example. You know, like I, I loved working with them. I loved hearing about like the things that they were learning and the things that they were working on, uh, you know, one of one of like honestly one of like my biggest regrets in life was leaving that job uh, just a few um, like a few uh, months before one of my coworkers got married, and I was like so excited and like thinking about going to that wedding, um, but uh, you know because I left that job and and was at another job I just the thing it just didn't work out, so. All of this to say that, like, I think all of the things that make me, all of the things that make me a good manager today, all, uh, they all existed then, like the same traits, that, that caring, like that desire for servant leadership. But, like, I, I just, there was no space for that. Like, I, I really, I think, you know, like, I, another way to put it is, like, in order to, in order to succeed, or in order to um, uh, grow uh, in, in, in a different way from, from like the core function of your job. Uh, so like the core function of my job is uh, writing code and being a consultant. And in order to grow in any way beyond that. So for example, um, uh, I, I'm particularly skilled in uh, coordinating, in, in, in like strategy uh, in my job. Um, like strategy amongst like several teams, when, when several teams are trying to figure out like how do we prioritize work across several teams. That's something that I found like I'm very good at. But I never would have had an opportunity to even know I was good at that and no one at work would have given me the opportunity to do that if I wasn't at least good in a baseline way at that core function of my job. And it's the same with, with management. Um, no matter how empathetic I am, uh, no matter how 
uh, uh, caring I am about uh, growing other people. If I was not a good engineer, um, I would not have been able to um, get that promotion. Or, or even like really realize that I would want to do that because I would have been just like kind of treading water, which is what I did most of my career. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Round of applause. Um, so I will, I'll just add uh, one more thing. So, um, you know, like uh, Pivotal Labs is, is hiring. So if, if some of the things that I've talked about, uh, pair programming, test-driven development, if, if any of that is interesting to you, um, please reach out to me. Um, and uh, I'd love to talk more about that. Um, and, uh, and also, if, if some of our other practices, like uh, product management and product design, um, if, if those things interest you, um, we'd, be, we'd love to uh, you know, have you come out and check out the office and stuff like that. Thank you. Nice. So we've got uh, about 30 minutes or so to stick around if you want to mingle with folks, talk about jobs with, uh, with Matthew. That'd be great. Um, thanks to Jolly again for handling the, the live stream and to Diana for the captioning tonight and to ThoughtBot for hosting. All right. That's it. <laughs>